Hello and welcome to Living Hope Boise Sermons. Today in a message titled, Looking for Life in All the Wrong Places, Pastor Chris discusses how Solomon sought meaning in worldly things. So now join us and open up Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And guys, this message really, uh, it's for you. Now to be sure, this is going to apply to all of us across the board, absolutely. Um, But for the dads today, I want you to look at this guy, the preacher, Solomon, who had it all. There's no guy put in his position that would refuse to do what he did. And dads, uh, we're going we're, to listen closely here. Uh, we're going to most of all learn from this writer, this preacher of Ecclesiastes 2, and his words of caution in many ways. So when we look at this chapter, I subtitled this thing, Ecclesiastes 2, Looking for Life in All the Wrong Places. Now, if you're probably over, I don't know, 40, uh, there's a certain song that pops in your head from uh, Johnny Lee back in the day, looking for love in all the wrong places. Don't worry, I will not sing it, but I will do you the gift and it'll be stuck in your head all day. You're welcome. So, uh, but here's a guy who is really, truly going to give us, in a sense, an autobiography. He's going to lay out here his conquests to do it. And there is this constant ebb and flow, this constant tension in Ecclesiastes of a guy who said, I'm going to figure it out. I thought in my mind, I felt in my heart, I'm going to conquer life. That's really, to me, if you boil this whole thing down, here's a guy who says, I'm going to conquer life, and I'm going to do it my way. And for a lot of men, there is this element of, we want to be self-made men. We want to do it on our own. Even if we know we're hitting our head against a wall, even if we know we're going to dig a hole only to have somebody else come and fill it, we're going to dig that hole. And all the wives said, that's right, all right, all the husbands, now you know who who, we know who to talk to. So, um, but seriously, there is something that is just in us that says, yeah, God, I know you created us. I know you're the, 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 you're the author of all wisdom and all knowledge and everything. And I know what you've said, but despite that, I'm still going to, I think I might be the exception. How many guys out there, you know there's things in your life, you're like, I know this has never worked for any other man in, in, in history, but there, I'm saying there's a chance. And so we see a guy here today who's done this. Uh, and, and, and in the words of Solomon, as we see here, it's going to depend on your perspective. In some ways, Solomon understood the theory of relativity in a, in a sense way before Einstein did. You know, the theory of relativity, it's how people can see the same event, observe it, but, but they see it in very different ways based upon their perspective. That's what Ecclesiastes is. It's life from under the sun, the S-U-N, from a human vantage point, in life in the Son, the S-O-N, God the Son, God the Father, from God's vantage point. And I did mention last week that we would start off today talking a little bit about Solomon. And I think it's important for us uh, to talk about why we believe that Solomon wrote this book, because he is the, the, the key figure in this thing. And, and we do believe that Solomon wrote this book because it, it seems awful clear here. It doesn't, it, it doesn't take a detective, a super sleuth, to just read this book at face value and figure out who it is describing. Look, uh, I want to do a fast little aside real quick, a little excursus before we do this, and that is uh, I want to talk about the fact that we don't, when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to the Bible, there's this very basic principle of biblical interpretation, and that is, if there's an obvious meaning or conclusion to be drawn to something in Scripture, you go with that, unless there's a reason not to, right? And we don't place more authority, and hear me here, we don't put more authority on sources outside of the Bible than the Bible itself. That's what cults do. That's a very dangerous precedent to set when you take what the Bible says and what seems to be really clear, and you take an outside source, be it a book, be it a person be in any kind of authority, and you say, yeah, I know the Bible is saying that, but this other source tells me no, that, that's a horrible way to go and a very dangerous way to go. So I, I, I want you to write down, look, we could do, you can go to undergrad, grad, postgrad, all kinds of things when it comes to learning about biblical interpretation. But honestly, you can distill it down to four very simple rules that if you follow, 
It, you will avoid the vast majority of heresy, false teaching, cult teaching, all that kind of stuff. I have them up here on the screen. And I would encourage you to just memorize these four simple things. It's really easy. Number one, when it comes to interpreting our Bibles, including Ecclesiastes, because it's part of the Bible, Scripture interprets Scripture. Just that one on its own, just that idea on its own, really uh, would keep us in a, in, a, in a place from falling into error. Because no verse in the Bible ever stands on its own. It's the Bible in light of the Bible in light of Scripture. So Scripture interprets Scripture. If you think you have uh, something that contradicts itself, I promise you it doesn't contradict itself in light of greater Scripture. So not only does Scripture interpret Scripture, but context interprets Scripture. So I spent last week in the introduction saying that this is wisdom literature. That is different than a doctrinal book or a, a, a prophecy book or a history book or, or many of the other genres of the Bible. So the context, who wrote it, who they wrote it to, and when they wrote it. And even to some degree, sometimes the author says why he wrote it. That's the context. That also spills into the third thing, which is intent. What was the intent of the author through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? In other words, there was a message to be uh, uh, conveyed through all, all Scripture. So Scripture interprets Scripture. Context inter interprets Scripture. Intent interprets Scripture. And then always, number four, the clear interprets the obscure. I spent time talking about that in, in Acts when we were looking at baptism and, and if baptism was a part of salvation or not. So with that in mind, why do we say that Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes? Well, if you look at chapter 1, verse 1 in your Bible, hopefully you've got it open now to, to, to Ecclesiastes. If you just read it, it says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So automatically, we're given a description of the author, a qualifier. He is a son of David. Now, if it means literally the only son of David who was king, it would have to be Solomon, because Solomon's the only son of David directly that was king. Now, son of David also can be used in perpetuity, so it could mean uh, any number of the kings that were Solomon's sons. So we know that, but if you even look down, uh, just down at verse 12 in chapter 1, it says, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. That right there pretty much makes this an open and shut case because he's referring to the United Kingdom. After Solomon, there was no United Kingdom anymore. In other words, when Solomon's boys took over, Rehoboam and Joaboam, and they split the kingdom, the northern tribes became known as Israel, and the southern tribes became known as Judah. At that point, the capital, Jerusalem, would be in Judah, not in Israel. So that right there is enough to honestly say, that's good enough. However, in, in this wheelbarrow full of uh, evidence for Solomon writing this, chapter 2, which we're looking at today, you can overlay that all over 1 Kings chapter 4, 1 Kings 10, 1 Kings 11. All these descriptions of Solomon and his life, they dovetail pretty much perfectly with the descriptions here. Uh, you could continue on uh, l later into chapter 7, and it has some specifics there describing the author that apply to Solomon. Last of all, and I'm just really doing an abbreviated version here, in, in chapter 12, verse 9, it tells us the author of Ecclesiastes wrote many proverbs that were recorded and that were a part of, uh, of the Jewish text. And so that, again, in itself points to Solomon. Uh, there, there are verses in Kings all over the place that describe this. As a matter of fact, in 1 Kings chapter 4, just to give you an example, it says in 1 Kings 4.20 that Judah and Israel here were as many as the sand by the sea. There we, again, we see Judah and Israel. This is, this is all whole kingdom. It says here that they ate and drank and were happy, and Solomon ruled over all the kingdom from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines uh, and to the, la the border of Egypt. And then it says here, they brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. So what we're going to see today is somehow that the writer of Ecclesiastes, the preacher, had so much money, he literally could do whatever he wanted, however he wanted, to, to almost limitless wealth that the, the writer is going to have. So that's why we say, and we will refer to Solomon as the writer of Ecclesiastes throughout this book here. But, but good stuff there. So today, Solomon is going to share the 
honestly, the futility, the vanity, the meaninglessness of his own pursuits in life. There are three areas that Solomon walks us through today regarding his life and why he thought he might find meaning. He thought he might find life in these areas. And here's the thing. This is written almost 3,000 years ago, and it was almost like he was looking into the future, and he saw a country called America, and he especially saw men who would search for life and meaning and purpose in the same things that he himself pursued hard. And when we look at the first few verses here, we're going to see that he was looking for life. He was looking for the meaning of life in possessions and in pleasure. Now, let me ask you an honest question. I don't mean this is a trick question. I I want you to answer this honestly. Do you think that God is pleased when you rightly enjoy, I said the caveat there is rightly enjoy, Is God pleased when we rightly enjoy the pleasures of this life? Yes or no? Absolutely. We say that. We know that. God has given us so many good things. He created, and he even tells us, right? He created these things for us, for us, and for our pleasure. It says that. He gave us these good things, but the problem is the human heart likes to take these good things and make them God things. We, we, John Calvin famously said, and it's so true, he said, the human heart is a factory of idols. The human heart is a factory of idols. And we can make an idol out of anything. Right? I, and I mean anything. Anything can, can consume us in a way. And we, be, we can become so attached emotionally, physically, uh, um, spiritually, you name it, to many things that, that, that God never intended for us to take to that level. And Solomon's going to tell us today in this chapter, hey man, I went after pleasure. I went after possessions. I went hard after these things. So he will actually do us the favor of listing some of these things. And understand, in this list, these things aren't bad things. They're not sinful things. But they were things that even... In our culture today, so many men abuse these things because they put them in a, they, 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 they attach much more significance and meaning and purpose to them than God ever intended. So the first thing it's going to say in verse 2, well, let me, say, let, me, let me read verse 1. So in verse 1, Solomon says, and look here, it says, I said in my heart, this is not divine wisdom from God. This is the musings of a guy who... This is almost going to sound like he's in the middle of a midlife crisis. He's, he's, he's spilling the tea on himself and his own uh, pursuits here. So he says, in my heart I said, come now, I'm going to test things with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. If it feels good, go after it. If you want it, go after it. He, he gives us the conclusion. He goes, but behold, this is vanity. And it could have ended there. But he's going to go, out, go ahead and go on to explain it. Because the first thing he's actually, and it's interesting, the first thing he'll go after in verse 2 is entertainment. He specifically in, in, in verse 2 mentions comedy. How many of y'all like comedy? I, I love comedy. I love a good comedian. Uh, I, I like good comedies on TV. I, I, there's something I just... Uh, Love to just laugh. I love to laugh. I would much rather laugh than cry, okay? And uh, it, it is in some way, oh, there's some escapism there, right? Part of what's fun about comedy is the best comedians take the things of life and help us laugh at ourselves and each other, you know, and others. But, uh, but, but comedians are, are, that, that are well do that. And, and he went after comedy. It says in verse 2, I said of laughter... Yeah, it's mad. It's in a pleasure. What use is it? I mean, you look at the billions upon billions, I'm sure into the trillions of dollars spent in our culture on entertainment. On, you go to these stadiums. Okay? Uh, I went to a, a, a stadium in Texas, a uh, baseball stadium, Globe Life Field. And I mean, that thing was in the billions of dollars to build. And across the street was Jerry World, AT&T Stadium. 
And we have built these, these massive buildings all in the name of entertainment or another word we use for that is what? Amusement. You know what's interesting is, do you know what the word amusement means? It comes from a Greek word, amuse, which is ah, muse. What does it mean to muse about something? It means to think. The Greek prefix ah means no. So amusement means something that I don't have to think about. It literally means it's an escape. And that's why the amusement industry is so big. Because we love nothing more than to pretend our lives are awesome, but we sure want to escape them. Like that's, we, have it, we have that everywhere. You ever been to Disney? You ever go to Universal Studios? I mean, uh, the, the American machine, right? The economy is so driven in a lot of ways by entertainment. And I said, entertainment's not bad. Why, are, why do we even have a sense of humor? God wired us with a sense of humor. He, he created us to laugh. God laughs. You know, it, it's like we've got all these different outlets and menus, but, but Solomon would say, hey, man, it didn't all, yeah, I laughed. And in the moment, it was fun. But, but then it was like right back, back to life, back to reality, always a return. He's trying to escape things here. In verse 3, he's going to talk about he, he thought he might have his escapism at the end of a bottle. He said here, I searched in my heart, verse 3, to know uh, how to cheer my body with wine, which is immediately not like the, 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 the purpose of it, the God-given purpose of it. He said, my heart still guiding me with wisdom in how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. Right? And again, everything in this list is neither saying you must do this or you must not do this. But what it's saying is, if you are looking for life, if, if the only way you can cope in life is through alcohol, through getting buzzed, or worse, through getting drunk, then you're abusing it and you're only actually hurting yourself and potentially others. Right? That, that, that is, the, the Bible says a lot about wine. Okay, both as an, it, it, you, properly as a gift of God, uh, improperly, boy, it, 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 it's a ruiner. And Solomon's lie, and here's a guy, think about it. Here's a guy who, with a, a, a credit card with no limit on it, can go anywhere he wanted, buy anything he wanted as far as alcohol. There was no wine, there was no spirit, there was no drink that was not accessible to him because of cost. And I, I am sure that he went and thought, you know what, I had the best from this region, the best from that region, and this is, you know, this is 100 proof. He, he probably went way down the line there, but at the end, it's like, when it was all done, back to reality. So that didn't work. He says now in verses 4 through 6, and here's a guy who obviously had a, an eye for engineering, for architecture, for beauty, and he's going to talk about here, could you imagine if you came over to my house, and when you came to my house, I said, oh, yeah, here's my 18-hole championship golf course in my backyard. Here is my orchard. Here is my ranch. All those things. So let's look at, look at verse 4. I made great works. I built houses, and I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks. I planted in them all kinds of trees. I made myself pools. He builds in irrigation, pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. So we see here in verse 4 through 6 that he thinks that I will, I, I'll build beautiful places. And I can say, for me, the way God wired me, I enjoy beautiful gardens. I enjoy beauty in nature. I love to be in the forest. I love to be at the ocean. Um, when, when we go to Hawaii, to the big island, uh, we love to go over to the Hilo side, uh, where it's rainforesty, and go to the botanical gardens over there. They're beautiful. They're amazing. And Solomon, through his brilliance, would have created a means and a ways to have probably every plant that was purchasable on the face of the earth at that time brought in into that semi-arid climate. And, and he, he came up with ways to, to make everything look amazing. There's actually some ruins there from where they think his pools were, where these, these, there's three pools 
that would uh, uh, cascade down into each other, and they're like the size of, of football stadiums. They're massive. So he builds these beautiful areas to congregate, to enjoy. Not only that, verses 7 through 9, he's going to buy people to serve him. He says, I got male and female slaves or servants, and I had so many of them that they, had, they were even born in my house. I also, I had great possessions of herds and flocks. He's got a ranch. He's got a ranch like no other. Solomon, you imagine Solomon in his cowboy hat there, and he's up on his horse and just, just kind of looking all bonanza up there. More than any other who'd been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself, ready, silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. He, so here he's got the park. He's got his own golf course. He's got his own botanical garden. He's got his own ranch. He's got a cattle ranch like no other. He has horses. He has it all. He has servants. He has so many servants, we'll look at it later, to feed his household every day. It actually tells us how much food was required to feed his household. It's enormous. But then it says here he's got gold and silver and treasure over in Kings when it talks about the, the queen of Sheba coming to visit him and how much she brought him. And, that, and that's one of the in interesting things is that Solomon is funding all these things somehow through his wisdom. And then it goes on to say, for all, all my music people out there, I got singers, both men and women, the gift of music. How many of you like music? You like to listen to music? I love music. I love going to a concert. But you know what's funny? I don't know if you ever stopped to realize this. Did you know that you have the ability to, on demand, you can listen to music? How do you do that? Your phone, right? You go to Spotify or Amazon Music or Prime uh, or, or, or iTunes, whatever. You can literally get out your phone and you can pretty much now listen to any song you want. We don't even think about that. A hundred years ago, how did you hear music? Somebody had to be doing it, right? Someone had to be singing or playing. So like we live in this little tiny sliver of technology in the, in the history of humanity. To hear music, we take that for, like for them, that was a gift. I can literally, I can, I can listen to anything. I, I can grab my phone and listen to whatever I want, whenever I want. So, so for, that, for, for, for most of humanity, they didn't have that. But Solomon, he's like, what do I want to listen to tonight? What do I want to listen to? He doesn't get his, his, his phone out and open up an app. He just says, hey, have him come down tonight and play that set. So this is, this is such an extravagance. And then it closes this part on possessions and pleasures, and he's like, oh, hey, just a little closing thing here. I had all these concubines, which that's, again, ties to Solomon, the delight of the children of men. He's like, I had it all. I had it all. I had money. I had uh, power. I had sex. I had er all these things. I had it. And the result was, didn't make me happy. Everyone's like, yeah, I might be that exception, though. But I'm telling you, if it could have made him happy, he would have been one of the happiest men's. Uh, ha happiest men. Men's, I just made that. It's Father's Day. I can say men's. All right. Let me show you how large his household was. In 1 Kings 4, it says Solomon's provision for one day, y'all, one day, it was 30 cores of fine flour, uh, 30 cores of, fl of flour and 60 cores of meal. That's a lot, let me just tell you. That is a lot of flour and a lot of cornmeal. Okay, and then it says here, uh, 10 fat oxen, right? That's where you get the ribeyes and some of those good cuts. And 20 pasture-fed cattle, 100 sheep besides deer, gazelle, roebucks, no seers, and fat and fowl, right? He had foie gras before nobody, anyone knew what that was. I mean, here's a guy, so when you add all that up, that's enough food to feed 35,000 people. And that's probably his family and his staff 
and basically his, he's, he's providing for his own there. That's every day. So what I'm saying is this. We understand from him that realistically speaking, there is no pleasure, there is no possession, I promise you this on earth, that will keep you satisfied or happy. Oh, but we'll try, won't we? We will try. I, one of the, to me, one of the simple things that I enjoy in life, I love coffee. Okay? And you hear me talk about it all the time. Man, I, I've got some fine, fine Cavista coffee here from my, my friend in Eagle. Shameless plug. But I mean, I can't wait to have coffee in heaven. What is coffee going to taste like in heaven? It's going to be amazing. So I have got 12 ounces of the finest Cavista coffee here. I should, Lord, thank you for that. And I see Jonah. Jonah, you're drinking Cavista coffee. Well, you, how big is your cup? 16 ounces. Okay, well, why, how do you have more coffee than I do? The Lord provided it. I don't think that's very fair. I'm older and wiser and better looking. I mean, all the things. Do I want it? I, yes, I do want that larger cup. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Lord, thank you that you have increased my coffee. That I, I, you know, I was thankful until I saw he had more. You haven't, how big is that cup? How, how, did you get, I have six, well, how did you get 20 ounces, Jonah? The Lord, the Lord provided me. Sure, sure. I don't think that's very fair. How come you keep having more than me? I, you know, I was happy with this till I saw you and your cup. You yeah, I do want it. Of course I want it. I want a bigger boat. I want a bigger house. I want the nicer car. The better job. Better boss. No doubt. All right, I am so done. This, this is all the coffee I will ever need. There could never be a cup, I'm sure, bigger than this. So I am content with my 20 ounces of cup. <laughs> Jonah, I don't, how much coffee is that? I think a gallon. A gallon. <laughs> I'm going to pray for your kidneys. <laughs> how do you have a, how do you have a, look, I, I'm struggling here. How do you have a gallon of coffee? The Lord provide. I knew you were going to say that. I really don't think that's very fair. No, I don't want it. You can take your coffee. Matter of fact, I don't even like coffee anymore. Right? Isn't that what we do, though? Oh, I don't even, you know, God, you know what, God, I'm not even going to try anymore. I don't even care anymore. And we totally, like, it's, it's just, it never ends. It never ends. And I'm telling you, we tell ourselves just this next, man, just, just one more thing, just one more this, one more that. I don't care what it is. And then you get it, and you're like, still same old me. Still same old me. Looking for life through possessions and pleasure. It does nothing wrong, and they do bring some level of happiness. Solomon will tell us that. But it doesn't last. It's not joy either. So he's like, you know what? That doesn't work. So I'm going to look for life. I'm going to look for the meaning of life. Let's go a whole different direction. Let's try between the ears. Let's look at it through philosophy. Look for life through philosophy. That's verses 12 through 17. Mankind has long looked for meaning and answers by gazing into his own navel. Right? We know that. There have been many men and women throughout history who've had deep and profound thoughts. But many of those thoughts, truth be told, they're actually meaningless. They're actually vanity, like Solomon will discover here. It's fascinating because there are people who are, most of us are drawn to the possessions and the pleasures. But there are some who are like, oh, it's all about, uh, it's all about looking into the stars and wondering and trying to, trying to wrap our minds around it all. Verse 12. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. He's looking at all these different ways to maybe explain life. And there are different elements of psychology and philosophy that get into these things. He says, for what can man or what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what's been done. 
that I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly. Again, I saw, he's speaking from his perspective. I saw, hey, the wise man is better off than the foolish man. Because there's, uh, there's more gain in light than darkness. The wise person, well, he's got his eyes open. He's got his eyes in his head. He's, he's, he's at least paying attention. But the fool, the fool's got his eyes closed. He's like, woo, here we go. So that's what he's saying there. He, he's, he's noticed this about mankind from a mankind perspective. The fool walks in darkness. But I, he goes, but yet, Eeyore, I perceive that the same event happens to them all. They're all still going to die. I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? I, why, have I, why am I so smart? It's a burden. It's a, like, here's this guy. He's like, what a pity party. But nobody, nobody sees it but me. Man, if you're saying that, my friend, uh, let Solomon help you. I said in my heart that this also is vanity, meaningless. For of the wise, as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance. Seeing that in the days to come, hey man, they're all forgotten about. They're long forgotten. How the wise then dies just like the fool. Look at 17. So I hated life because what is done under the sun from a humanist, uh, humanistic point of view, it was grievous. It's vanity. It's chasing. It's striving after the wind. It's a wild goose chase with no goose. He's like, I really thought I would kind of find things by entering that world. In, in philosophy, I would say specifically, particularly humanistic or hedonistic philosophy, has largely said, right, over the centuries, to follow your heart. It's all about you anyways. I mean, if there is no God, then you are the greatest being in the world. So, hey, follow your heart. Make your rules. Do life your way. And Ecclesiastes is all about really the human heart. He, he echoes that all over the place. That's why, as a believer, the worst advice you tell someone is, well, follow your heart. You know, it's like the, your heart gets you in a lot of places that are full of pain and misery. Just ask Solomon or many other people in Scripture. It's, it's when we, like the idea of going uh, and trying to find life in philosophy. It's why we have so many causes out there, right? This often leads to, uh, to, to faulty purpose through heartfelt but ill-informed causes, right? How many people, uh, sometimes it feels like you've got you to have breakfast, lunch, dinner, and a cause. That, that's what you need for, for to, to, to be happy in life. I mean, it's really how we ended up here uh, recently with all these college campuses, right? You've got all these people locking themselves in rooms and putting tents in the middle of campus and all these things protesting uh, for Palestine, right? Protesting for a, a, a nation where they condoned this horrible act of terrorism towards Israel and saying, oh, the, the Palestinians are the ones who are the victims here. And you're like, how do you arrive at that conclusion here? Well, because a lot of people, to get behind a cause, they'll throw wisdom and they'll throw even truth and facts and whatever away because it's ultimately all about the cause. And that's how come man mankind gets behind, like people will have some really interesting causes out there and they will wrap their, uh, their lives in their life's purpose and value into that cause. And Solomon's like, Solomon probably had causes that he was a part of. But it did not bring the life or the meaning of life. It didn't satisfy still. So then he, and I like this next part because I really love this thing, he considers and he looks for life in profession, in his work, in vocation. Now, some of you love your job, and some of you hate your job. Some of you like your boss, and some of you maybe not so much. But regardless of that, the Bible says a lot about work, a lot about profession. Let's, let's look at the verses here, and then we'll talk about this, all right? Look at verse 18. So he says, I hated all my work, my toil, in which I worked or toiled under the sun. 
seeing that I did all this stuff and I have to leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Now, we see that all the time, right? People build empires, business empires. They build companies. They, do the, they build these organizations. And then they leave them to their kids and their kids squander it all. That's what happened to the kingdom after Solomon left, actually. It says here, uh, yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This is vanity. So I turned about and I gave my heart up to despair. He's just like, oh, what's the point? Over all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did none of those things for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the work and toil and uh, in striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. So encouraging. Happy Father's Day. Even in the night, eat love. Hey, American friends, even in the night, he can't sleep because his brain won't shut off. He can't, he can't find quiet. You're like, oh, 3,000 years ago, they, had, uh, they couldn't sleep either? They had Ambien back there? No, he, you know, he, he, he couldn't fall asleep. And when he fell asleep, he couldn't stay asleep because he couldn't shut He was so worried about everything. Boy, he, he's, in, he's struggling here with anxiety because of all these things. And, and he says, man, it's just all vanity. It is just vanity. Because though work is a very good thing, it is not the thing. And I'll say this, Americans tend to have two predominant attitudes about work, and they're both wrong. One idea, one American attitude about work is work is the biggest, most important thing in life. And I, and I love that attitude as long as it's the right way, but it becomes unhealthy when people sacrifice all the other things for work. Work is a, by its nature, work's a good thing. And, and I say, man, give me the person who wants to work hard. Because work's not a curse. Work's actually not a punishment. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 2, in verse 15, when God creates creation and creates Adam, and everything is still perfect. It says here that God took the man, he took Adam, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it. So God actually didn't create work as a punishment. God created work as a gift. So I understand that, like, you know, we can take that gift, but we can make it an, an, an idol. And work, we should work hard, and we should be, wherever you work at, if you're a believer and they know you're a believer, they ought to say, wow, Christians make the best employees. That should be what they should say of us. But we can take it to a point where people sacrifice faith and their family, uh, their, all kinds of things for this. And then at the end of the day, every one of them looks back with regret. You know it, and I know it. And then we have the other side of it, which is like, I hate work. I don't want to work. If I didn't have to work, I wouldn't work. Uh, and, 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 there, and there tends to be this attitude of work is just, you know, something that is just a dirge. And, there's, and that's a complete misunderstanding of what work is itself. Work is good. And we're actually commanded to work. And work looks different for different people depending on their season of life. But nonetheless, we all work. Look, let me ask you this question. Is your work... Is your work a means to accomplish your heart's desires? Or is your work a means to provide for your family, provide for others, contribute to society? And ultimately, what's the point of work? To glorify God. Paul would write about that. You will not find life and the meaning for life in that profession. But that profession, but that work, though, done rightly... It actually harmoniously, it's a part of, it's an instrument, right, in, in the chorus of how God intended for life to be lived. But it is, it's a good thing, but it is a horrible idol. And when work becomes an idol, like all idols, it disappoints and it leads to heartache. So he does close it out, though, on a quasi-positive note-ish. 
he says here, the meaning of life, the true meaning of life, it is found in the creator and redeemer of life. Let's look at the last couple of verses. 24, it says, there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. There is, there is some truth to that. Even the world outside of those who follow God, they can find some enjoyment in those things. Because God's general grace on this planet, the things God created, like God created food so we can eat it and enjoy it. That's why, that's why so many people enjoy food and, and drink and work. And he's like, I created that to be enjoyed rightly. So he's acknowledging that. This also I saw, it's from the hand of God. But then he's like, because look, even apart from him though, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. He gives these things to him, but to the sinner, he has given the busyness of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God. He's like, this is all vanity. It's striving again after wind. He's just reminding us that, that we, we can, it is again, it is okay. It is even sometimes an act of worship when we enjoy those things the right way. And if, if, if we are enjoying it, it's kind of like the entire time we're enjoying it, we see in the background, there's God. And God is going, I did that for you. I allowed you to have this. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Just remember, though, it's not me. It's not to be worshipped or pursued like I am. But I have given this to you because I love you and I've blessed you. And praise his name for those things. The true meaning of life. He would say there, he uses both the word enjoy, joy, and happiness. He uses these different feelings. And those things can mean very, very different things. What he is honestly saying here, in a sense, is this. You're either happy or you're not. You're either happy or you're unhappy. If you're happy, you have levels of happiness, and sometimes there's more happiness than le and less. Paul talks about that. Paul's like, for me to, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Like, you can't beat that guy. The Bible says much about joy and happiness. Joy is an attitude. It's an act of will, submitting to God and being joyful in Him. Happiness is a feeling. It could come and go as fast, as quickly as a moment. They are different, but they are related for the Christian, right? Because people can have happiness without having joy because of the fleeting and, 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 and the, how, how superficial it can be, but you actually really shouldn't have joy without having happiness, right? It's like having a candle that smells like uh, fresh-baked cookies, you walk in the house, you're like, oh, there's cookies, I smell it. Oh, it's only the candle. You can have the feeling of it without the actual substance. And happiness in a lot of ways is what the feeling of joy is without the substance itself, which is God. And the other things to be enjoyed under the umbrella of God and his way. Bottom line is Solomon's like, you can enjoy those things, but above it all, if you don't enjoy God first, those other things are just not going to, they're not going to make the difference. They're not going to eternally and permanently satisfy and satiate. That being said, I have two quick applications from here we're going to look at for the dads uh, to write down two simple statements. I I'm not going to spend a lot of time because you'll know what I mean here, but I want to give you them because they fit in with this, this narrative. All right? The first thing is this, being with versus being near. Now, for the dad out there, right, we, we talk about all the times uh, you want to be around your kids, being near them. Being near your kids is not the same as being with your kids. I know, uh, I, I see this a lot. I see a lot of dads who are in the same physical area as their kids, but they're not engaged. They're not talking, they're not sharing, they're not asking, they're not playing, they're not down on the ground, you know. They're not, all, all, all those things, right? And, and, so, and I say this because Solomon's like, hey, God isn't just to be near us. God is to be, he is with us. Matter of fact, one of the names for Jesus is Emmanuel, which is God with us. Not God near us, God with us. And dads, your family needs you to be with them, not just near them. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have are, are, are these things. Because I've seen a lot of dads, kids are right there, and dad's on here. 
And if you're on here, you're near them, but you're not with them. It cracks me up. Like, we'll go and you'll see families on vacation. And the parents got their laptops out, their iPads out, and the kids are playing. Are they together? Yeah. But are they with each other? No. It's like when we go to the ocean sometimes, and, and you'll see parents sitting down, they're on their phones, and the kids are out in the ocean. I'm going to grab the phone and throw it in the water and say, I'm going to make you like, go with your kids. Go be with them. And I get that that can be a challenge. Like my kids, right, I'm, I'm, I'm still bitter about the fact that none of my children uh, pursued any of the Santa Guida trinity of sports, right? For me growing up, it was just a family right that you played football, basketball, and baseball, right? The holy trinity of sports. Football, basketball, baseball. None of my kids by high school did any of those things. I was very hurt by it because that's what we loved. Instead, they got into things like mountain biking. I only got into mountain biking because my boys did. And I was like, there's not even an engine on this thing. You know, like, what? what? I remember my youngest son going into his freshman year when he should have been playing football. He said, hey, Dad, I'm going to run cross country. I was like, why? <laughs> Running is the thing you do to accomplish whatever sport it is. It's not, like, that's not the sport. Oh, no, Dad. I, and he had all these reasons, and I was like, You've got, you're just going to run. And then, oh, you want us to come watch you run. That sounds exciting. Do they keep score? Well, there's a time. Well, football has a timer and a score. So we discovered, though, first cross-country race we go to, it was kind of fun. And four years later, when he finished high school, we drove all over the place. We'd get up crazy early on a Saturday morning and drive from Central Oregon to Eugene or Salem or Portland or you name it, uh, even over to the coast, right? We would drive to watch him run for 18 minutes. <laughs> and then, well, that was fun. Get back in the car. But you know what? It meant the world to him. And not only were we, because I realized while he's running, I'm not with him. I couldn't have run a 5K in 18 minutes to save my life, but he could. But we were near him, but then that nearness resulted in, in the, on the way home, being with him. Or when he got home, being with him and talking and celebrating. And it's like, be in your kid's life, right? Don't try to force them to live your life and what you like, because they may not be wired like you. I, I mentioned this in the first service in the the comments from people after the first service about how their kids chose such different things to follow than the parents did. I'm like, God has a sense of humor. But be with them. Don't just be near them. The second thing we see from here in Solomon's life is this. Inconsistency never produces consistency. Dads, I know it's Father's Day. Let this be a lesson to us all. Inconsistency never produces consistency. Hear me here now. Follow me. Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Say that five times fast. Dads, what you say, yes, people hear that. And what you do, people hear that. What you do, your kids hear way louder and learn from what you do way more than what you say. Let me show you what I mean. Solomon would have told his boys to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They would have told, Solomon would have said, hey kids, and he had a bunch of them, he would have said, follow God. However, he would have said that, but his, his kids would have looked at his life and said, well, wait a minute. Because they would have known in Deuteronomy 17, 16, they would have known that it says there, hey, uh, to the king, don't acquire many horses. Well, Solomon had enough horses to fill either 4,000 or 40,000 uh, 40, stables. That's a lot of horses. And then it says here, don't go to Egypt to get those horses. Well, if you look at 1 Kings 10, look what happens. Solomon's import of horses from Egypt and Q, they were massive. He brought in, so he went to, he, he had a ton of horses and he got them from Egypt. He broke that. God said, don't do that. We also know in Deuteronomy 17, 17, it says, hey, don't go out there and marry a bunch of women. People who are like, eh, wasn't the Bible like all pro-polygamy? No, it wasn't. It only ever describes what happened. It never says God put a stamp of approval on that. 
right? He says here, don't, don't do that lest your heart turn away, which is exactly what happened. We see in 1 Kings 11.3, it says he had 700 wives and he had 300 combines. He was a farm, no, he had 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart. That's why I say, dads, your talk talks, yes. And your walk, how you live life, that talks too. Your walk screams actually what you believe way more than what you talk about. So, so men, dads today, what are you showing? Not telling, what are you showing your kids that is most important to you? What are you showing them that is more important than God? Recreation, sports, money, pride, work, resentment, all kinds of things there that we see. Guys, we have got to be consistent in our walks for our kids' sake. Inconsistency never produces consistency. I'm going to ask the word. That was Pastor Chris reminding us that contentment comes from God alone and not of the things of this world. If you enjoyed the sermon, you can continue listening on all major podcasting platforms. Or feel free to check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook at Living Hope Boise. We would also love to see you in person at 9 and 1045 a.m. on Sundays. And remember, we exist by the grace of God, for the glory of God, and for the good of all people.